The following is a CNN special report. This is the final curtain call. His last night was spent on stage. And I said, all right, love you. He goes, love you more. See you tomorrow. And then tomorrow never came. We have a, a, a gentleman here that needs help, and he's not breathing. And right then, I knew something was terribly wrong. I said, I said Janet, is he dead? And she said, he's gone. Do you think there was some sort of conspiracy to kill your brother? Absolutely. How are you feeling? Hey, hey. It's possible that Michael had been using this anesthetic drug maybe five or six years ago. Elvis was huge, but Michael went around the world. He was off the planet. Now, a behind-the-scenes look into the final days of Michael Jackson. As the sun rose above the exclusive Los Angeles Hills, inside Michael Jackson's mansion, the entertainer began the morning of June 24, 2009, doing what he loved, preparing for a show. Now do it slow. He and I would start about noon or 1 o'clock at his home. We'd dance a few hours and stretch. Uh -huh. You have to have a full attitude. You have a half attitude. Do the full one. Travis Payne was Michael Jackson's longtime choreographer. We were you know, on a journey with Michael that was going to return him to the stage, you know, um, that he loved so much. And I know that we were eight days away from leaving for London. The stage is where Michael was most at ease. On stage, there was no one better. Since age five, he'd electrified audiences around the world with hit songs like I Want You Back. And the world appeared ready to welcome him back. It had been 12 years since Jackson's last major performance. The king of pop was poised to regain his throne. This is it. I mean, this is really it. This is the final, this is the final curtain call. According to the contract okay. with concert okay. promoters um, AEG, Michael was to perform 50 concerts at the O2 Center in London over a nine-month period. I'll be performing the songs my fans want to hear. But was Michael physically up to the challenge? Both Michael and AEG had a lot on the line. It was his comeback. It was his renaissance, his rebirth on stage. After so many years of being out of the spotlight, a lot of people were wondering if he could pull this off. This is it and see you in July. But there were questions about whether Jackson was ready. Kenny Ortega, the director for This Is It, called a private meeting at Jackson's home. AEG CEO Randy Phillips attended the meeting. Kenny was concerned that he wasn't coming to enough rehearsals, that he was taking a little too nonchalant. Um, and Michael explained that he needed Kenny to build the house, and then he would come in and paint the front door. On the afternoon of June 24th, Jackson arrived at the Staples Center in downtown Los Angeles. Rehearsals for This Is It often ran late into the night. On the surface, the man many say was born to perform never looked better. Was his voice getting stronger over a period of rehearsal? Absolutely. Was his dancing getting stronger? Absolutely. His body, everything? Absolutely. Michael Bearden, the musical director for This Is It, was on stage that last night. He looked back at me, you know, after we did one number, and he looked at me as if to say, yeah, I'm Michael Jackson, I got this. You know, it, he looked really good, and I tease some of the dancers when I see them, because MJ was 50 years old, and they're like half his age, and he still was wearing them out. On stage, always a perfectionist. Off stage, a legend with a sense of humor. He's making big money decisions. And then he would lean over to me and just say silly stuff like, you know, who's your favorite Three Stooges? And I'll go, what, MJ? And he'd, oh, no, I don't like that. Yeah, can I have more of this on this? Oh, that's, yeah, I like Mo. 
But beneath the surface, concerns from the very moment the concert tour was announced. Jackson was pushing himself to the brink. I have to think, how's he going to do these shows? Record producer Rodney Jerkins. 50 dates at 50 years old? That's a lot of dates. And I was, you know, and I, and I kept saying, I just hope he gets a physical trainer, someone to really work him out, to make sure he's healthy and prepared. Jermaine Jackson says his little brother was ready. I mean, he could have did 200 shows there. I sat down with Jermaine following band rehearsals. I felt that he could do it um, because of the way the shows were spaced out, and it wasn't like every day. See, like when we first started, we were doing one-nighters where you go every day you're in a different place. Mm -hmm. You're riding a bus and you're sleeping on top of each other. That's tough. But this was an end. You didn't have to take the stage down. You were in one location. I think that night, he finally accepted down deep in whatever the inner reaches of an artist's soul are that he could do this. Was anything out of the ordinary that night? The only thing that might have been out of the ordinary is that Michael was had a serious glow about him that night. You could see his confidence growing, and he could see uh, physically he was able to do the things that he wanted to do. We were walking to our cars, and he put his arm around me at the Staples Center, and he said, thank you um, for getting me here. Now I know I can take, I can do it and take it from here. Hold for applause, hold for applause, slow umbrella fade out. Jackson left the Staples Center around midnight and headed to his rented mansion in the posh L.A. neighborhood of Holmby Hills. Just 12 hours later, however, nothing would ever be the same. Coming up... Tina, your mom said get down here. It doesn't look good. The tragic news no family wants to hear. I said, oh, my gosh, what's going on? A secluded L.A. mansion. A 911 call. Yes, he's not breathing, sir. Okay, and he's not conscious either. Not no, he's breathing. not conscious, sir. Okay. A 50-year-old man in distress. That man is Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, uh, the king of pop. He was taken to the hospital, and there were rumors. He was apparently administered CPR in the ambulance. As the news breaks, Jackson's brothers, Tito and Jermaine, begin to hear grim and troubling reports from loved ones and the media. Do you remember the day where you were and the time? Oh, yeah. I'll never forget it. Yes, I was, uh, happened to be home. My uh, middle son, Terrell, had called me on the phone and said, Dad, is it true what they're saying on TV about my Uncle Michael? I said, what are they saying? They say he was rushed to the hospital and, and uh, he's not breathing or something like that. I said, what? You guys called, CNN called my wife and said, do you know anything about Michael being rushed to the hospital? And so I said, no. And I called my mother immediately and she said she's on her way to the hospital. Jermaine's mother, Catherine, confirmed his worst fears. She was already at the hospital. And I called her back and I heard her say, he's dead. And I couldn't believe to hear my mother say, her child is dead, my brother. And I got weak, very, very weak. Tito Jackson couldn't get a hold of his mother as he raced to UCLA Medical Center. But a call from his sister, Janet, stopped him in his tracks. I said, Janet, is he dead? And she said, he's gone. And I just, I just melted right there, and I, I didn't know what to do. I pulled over in this parking lot and just cried for like 15 minutes and went back home. Jermaine Jackson did make it to the hospital as the crowds and media began to swell outside. Inside, his brother Michael lay dead. They had him, they had a sheet wrapped on top of him, and I could feel his skin. It was still soft and smooth, and I just 
kissed his forehead so much and I just talked to him. The memories, that's what hurt. And to know that there would never be another Jackson 5. Despite his overwhelming grief, it was Jermaine who delivered the family's official announcement that Michael was dead. And you have to go out from that hospital and you have to tell the world. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that I was announcing my brother's death for the world. Um, it was, I was numb, very numb because it was like a nightmare. My brother, the legendary king of pop, Michael Jackson, passed away on Thursday, June 25th, 2009 at 2.26 p.m. Were you able to see Jermaine do the press conference? I saw it on television. It was sad. I wish I could have been there, but I would have never made it in time. What were you thinking when you saw that? Shocking and hurting and just all type of emotions all hitting you at one time. Today, you can't do it without crying? No, still. You know, it's hard. It's really, it's a really a hard thing because uh, Michael was so special to not just me, but to everyone. Coming up, Michael Jackson's secret world of addiction. He also had many doctors who were always willing to write new prescriptions. This is CNN Breaking News. Michael Jackson, 50 years old, the king of pop, has died. As news of Michael Jackson's death sent shockwaves around the globe, the search for answers was just beginning. We're just looking for any evidence of foul play or, or anything like that. Within hours, investigators were on the scene of Jackson's Hollywood mansion. They soon discovered the singer had his own personal pharmacy. Some of the prescription drugs were labeled, many were not. The extent of Michael Jackson's drug use was starting to emerge. Some of his closest friends and family were stunned. I only knew of what he was taking to sleep. That's it. Now, hearing all these other things, which I can't even pronounce the words, I wasn't aware. If that led to dependency on, on anything else, I wouldn't know. But I'm just saying that every time I saw Michael, he was a thousand percent coherent. A thousand percent with a smile on his face. Michael's addiction did run much deeper, and many within his inner circle were aware. He certainly wasn't worried about concealing it. Gotham Chopra was a personal friend of Jackson's. He knew endless doctors, and he knew how to manipulate certain systems. He also had many doctors who were always willing to write new prescriptions, and, and they just wanted to be around him, and they wanted that aura of his attention. Gotham's father, physician Deepak Chopra, says Michael once asked him to write a prescription for a narcotic. I said I wasn't going to write a prescription. And when I confronted him, he started to cry. He said, uh, you don't understand, I'm in a lot of pain. Chopra says he feared for Jackson's health. So along with a member of Michael's family, he arranged an intervention. He was so upset, angry, burst into my temper left the room. According to biographer Randy Terraborelli, Michael Jackson was first introduced to prescription drugs in 1984. Jackson's scalp was severely burned during the filming of this Pepsi commercial. I was at the hospital that night, and I remember the doctors saying that they were trying to give him pain medication back then, and he would not take it. And that ultimately, uh, he, he did take some because the pain was so great, but that it was a big issue. When do you think the drug use started? I believe that a lot of it had to do uh, with the stress of the 1993 allegations. In 1993, Michael Jackson was accused of sexually molesting a 13-year-old boy. 
Jackson strongly denied the allegations during a televised statement. I am particularly upset by the handling of this mass matter by the incredible, terrible mass media. But eventually settled the case for $20 million. No charges were ever filed. During that same televised statement, Jackson also admitted publicly he had a drug addiction. As you may already know, after my tour ended, I remain out of the country undergoing treatment for a dependency on pain medication. Those allegations in 93, the first set of allegations, began the ruination of, of Michael. Ten years later, more accusations of child molestation. This time, there would not be a settlement. Charges were filed. A highly publicized trial followed. Faced with the possibility of prison, Jackson was in the fight for his life. The stress took a toll, even though he was cleared of all charges. What did you see in his eyes? I could see in his eyes that he was dying, that he was gone already. On verdict day, he was not there. He was so vacant. Following the verdict in 2005, Jackson spent the next four years focused on his children. Six months before his death, Michael Jackson met nurse practitioner Sherilyn Lee. She came to Jackson's home to treat one of his kids for a cold. One day, Lee says Jackson asked her to help him sleep. She agreed to stay over and monitor his sleeping patterns. This is 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Because I said, call me so I can kind of monitor and see what's going on. So he slept for about three and a half hours, and then he jumped up. He looked at me with his eyes wide open, and I said, Michael, you okay? He said, yes, but I just want you to see I can't sleep. Lee says Michael requested propofol, a drug few people had heard of. It is a powerful anesthetic that's only used in operating rooms or other clinical settings. Propofol isn't available as a pill. It can only be given intravenously. It puts a patient out almost instantly. I looked at him, and that was the first time I got this chill through my body. And I said, Michael, if you take that medicine, you might not wake up. Weeks later, Lee heard from Michael Jackson one final time. He wanted to see her right away. The singer complained that one side of his body was cold, the other was hot. I said, you know, I can't come, Michael. You need to go to the hospital. You need to go to the hospital. Just four days later, Michael Jackson was dead. Michael was a tortured soul. Ten years ago, he said to me, have you heard of this thing that takes you to the edge of the valley of death and then brings you back from there? Next. Why wasn't the doctor there? What happened the last hours of Michael Jackson's life? Why was he left alone? There's a lot of questions. Conrad Murray, one of the last people to see Michael Jackson alive. Murray was Jackson's personal physician. Statements are just minutes away in the trial of Michael Jackson. And on September 27, 2011, Murray would go on trial in Los Angeles, accused of giving Jackson drugs, including the powerful anesthetic propofol that caused Jackson's death. Let me call the case of the people of the state of California plaintiff versus Conrad Robert Murray, defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case will show. District Attorney David Walgren laid out the prosecution's case. Michael Jackson trusted his life to the medical skills of Conrad Murray. That misplaced trust in the hands of Conrad Murray cost Michael Jackson his life. To help prove their case, prosecutors presented two very different portraits of the pop legend. From a vibrant singer, dancer, and entertainer on stage, to a completely different person behind the scenes. To Michael Jackson. Then, midway through opening arguments, a stunning moment. The voice of Michael Jackson, as he'd never been heard before. When people leave my show, when I, I want to say, he's the greatest entertainer 
in the well. Jackson sounded fragile, impaired, incapable. I do. You may be seated. And that's just what Kenny Ortega feared. Ortega was directing the most anticipated show in decades, with a star he feared wasn't up to it. But Murray insisted he was in charge of Jackson's health. He said, I, I should stop trying to be an amateur doctor and psychologist and be the director and allow Michael's health to him. Uh, Those were the words of Conrad Murray. That's close. And on June 25th, yes. that meant helping Jackson get to sleep. Based on the affidavit, Dr. Murray's efforts to get Jackson to sleep began with a 10 milligram tablet of Valium around 1.30 a.m. It didn't work. So according to the affidavit, Dr. Murray injected the singer with an anti-anxiety drug. By 3 a.m., however, Jackson was still awake, so Murray told police he tried another drug, a sedative. That didn't work either. Murray told investigators at 10.40 a.m., he gave the pop legend 25 milligrams of propofol, a powerful surgical anesthetic, finally putting Jackson to sleep. But soon after, all hell broke loose. To describe the scene firsthand, Alberto Alvarez. Security guard Alberto Alvarez. He was laying on his back um, with his hands extended out. I observed that his eyes were, were slightly open or, or open, and his mouth was uh, uh, open. Alvarez said Murray was frantic and vague about Jackson's condition. I asked uh, uh, Dr. Conrad Murray what happened, and he said, he had a, re a reaction. He had a bad reaction. In the midst of the chaos, Alvarez spotted Jackson's children in the doorway. And they were right behind me. Uh, and um, Paris screamed out, Daddy. Dr. Conrad Murray said, Hurt, uh, uh, don't let them see their dad like this. We heard about Paris breaking down very powerful visual. That's one idea. Jim Moray is chief correspondent for Inside Edition. From the perspective of a juror and as a parent, can you imagine seeing your own father lying there, most likely dead, with his eyes wide open? We have a, a, a gentleman here that needs help, and he's not breathing yet. He's not breathing, and we need to. We're trying to pump him, but he's not. He's okay. Not okay. How is he? Finally, at 12.22 p.m., Alvarez called 911. As they waited for an ambulance, Murray asked Alvarez for more help. He reached over and grabbed a handful of vials, and then he reached out to me and said, here, put these in a bag. Jackson was officially pronounced dead at 2.26 p.m., June 25th, 2009. A direct result, said prosecutors, of mistakes, delays, and recklessness by Dr. Conrad Murray. Two bottles of lorazepam, lidocaine bottle. DA Walgren added into evidence each vial and bottle found at Jackson's house. Lumazino. One. Ephedrine. 20 after. 20 milliliter propofol bottles. Another. To take a patient with Valium, lorazepam, midazolam, and propofol, and to leave them unattended in that state is medical abandonment. Murray, of course, saw things quite differently, providing his version of events in a police interview recorded just days after Jackson's death. For me, Conrad uh, Roberts Murray. It was Jackson, Murray said, who told him all about propofol and insisted he use it to ease Jackson's crippling insomnia. He knew that that was the only thing that worked for him. I constantly cautioned him. Cautioned him and, claims Murray, tried to wean him from the drug. Still, Jackson pressed for propofol on the day he died. He said, I can't function if I don't sleep. So I agreed that I would switch over to the protocol. Then, Murray said, he sat at Jackson's side. I monitored him, saw his oxygen saturation, heart rate, everything looked stable. Then I needed to go to the bathroom. 
No, I came back to his bedside and was stunned in the sense that he wasn't breathing. Michael Jackson. The defense maintained that it wasn't Murray who administered the fatal dose. It was Jackson himself. When Dr. Murray left the room, Michael Jackson self-administered a dose of propofol that with the lorazepam created a perfect storm in his body that killed him instantly. The defense said it was the final fatal move for a man with a tortured history of substance abuse. I specialize in addiction medicine. Dr. Robert Waldman reviewed records from Jackson's dermatologist. In the months before his death, Jackson got frequent treatments and lots of painkillers. I believe there's evidence that he was probably addicted to opioids. For the Jackson family, they were hard words to hear. And they sat in that courtroom and listened to testimony that their son and brother was a drug addict. And often they had to leave, but they were always there the next day. The addiction, the insomnia, the desperation were so great, said defense experts, that Jackson swallowed powerful pills by the handful. That's enough to put six of you to sleep. But was Murray responsible for Jackson's fatal overdose? As the opposing attorneys gave their closing arguments, two very different answers emerged. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case is overwhelming that Conrad Murray acted with criminal negligence, that Conrad Murray caused the death of Michael Jackson, that Conrad Murray left Prince, Paris, and Blanket without a father. Dr. Murray. The defense insisted that Murray was driven by his own naive desire to help. He thought he could help, could help Michael Jackson succeed. He could help him sleep normally. He believed that. He was wrong. He was wrong. Because Dr. Murray had no control over this situation, because what was happening in the background, he was just a little fish in a big, dirty pond. Finally, it all rested with the jury. Two different versions, one man dead and another's freedom hanging in the balance. And we're following the breaking news this hour, a verdict in the involuntary manslaughter trial of Dr. Conrad Murray. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Conrad Robert Murray, guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter. After his conviction, Murray was sentenced to four years in prison. Coming up, claims that the promoters behind Michael Jackson's tour were responsible for Murray's negligence. The AEG defendants were negligent in hiring, retaining, or supervising Dr. Conrad Murray, and that that ultimately led to the death of Michael Jackson. intimate home videos and family photos used in court, a rare look at Michael Jackson as he grows from a young boy to one of the most celebrated entertainers of our time, performing songs like I Want You Back. And finally, into a father himself. Hi, my name is Prince Michael Jackson and I love my daddy. And I'm daddy's baby and I love my daddy. And my nervous dad is baby. <laughs> but by age 50, Jackson was gone. And his personal doctor, Conrad Murray, had been found legally responsible for his death. But was Murray solely to blame? Not according to the Jackson family. Michael's mother and his children went back to court in 2013, this time filing a wrongful death suit against concert promoter AEG Live. This case involved a number of legal questions. First of all, was Dr. Murray hired by AEG Live? Did AEG Live know that he was a risk to Michael Jackson? And should AEG Live pay damages? Kevin Boyle was the attorney for Katherine Jackson. The AEG defendants were negligent 
in hiring, retaining, or supervising Dr. Conrad Murray, and that that ultimately led to the death of Michael Jackson. AEG Live attorney Marvin Putnam said that Dr. Murray was working for Jackson and not the company. I, I can't quite understand how they're making the claim they're making, um, given Conrad Murray's own statement. Two days after Michael's passing, he said, um, I was hired by Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. I had worked for Michael Jackson for years. AEG Live stood to lose or gain millions based on the results of Jackson's concerts. And the Jackson family claimed AEG Live instructed Murray, quote, not to look out for Jackson's best interests, but rather to do whatever medical procedures were calculated to get Jackson to perform. And an email AEG Live co-CEO Paul Gongaware sent to the show's director seemed to support their theory. It really is a smoking gun. It's probably one of the most important pieces of evidence that Michael Jackson's attorneys have that AEG supervised, directed, uh, forced, employed Dr. Conrad Murray to provide Michael Jackson drugs so that he could perform. In a tape deposition played for the jury, Gongaware was confronted with the email he sent. It says, we want to remind him that it is AEG, not MJ, who is paying his salary. We want him to understand what is expected of him. Did you write that email? Uh, I don't recall. He uh, came across as suffering some sort of uh, executive amnesia, if you will. The Jackson family, in looking at that email, believes that AEG made it clear to Dr. Murray that he was supposed to make sure that Michael Jackson performed no matter what. Hold for applause, hold for applause, slow umbrella fade out. Show director Kenny Ortega emailed Gongaware 11 days before Michael's death with concerns about the singer's health. An emotional Ortega read his emails to the jury. There are strong signs of paranoia, anxiety, and obsessive-like behavior. I think the very best thing we can do is get a top psychiatrist to evaluate him ASAP. Ortega could see, perhaps better than anyone else, exactly what effect the grueling preparation was having on Jackson. The insight that he gave into what was happening with Michael in his last weeks was incredible about his deterioration about how he couldn't remember his lyrics to his songs, about how he wasn't getting the dances, and about the conversations with the AEG Live executives about what to do about Michael. AEG attorneys argued Michael Jackson was a drug addict who sought out doctors who would feed his addiction, like Conrad Murray. They brought out a long parade of doctors who had given Michael painkillers or had used propofol on Michael Jackson. The defense used the deposition of Randy Jackson, Michael's brother, to argue that not only was Michael addicted to drugs, but he would have resisted any attempts at an intervention. AEG Live said, if the family can't help him, if the family can't stop him, how could we as concert promoters ever be expected to have done that? Michael Jackson's two oldest children, Prince and Paris, were on the witness list to testify until... Paris Jackson, the 15-year-old daughter of pop icon Michael Jackson, was rushed to a hospital in Los Angeles. In the midst of the trial, near tragedy. Michael Jackson's daughter, Paris, was rushed to the hospital after cutting her wrists in an apparent suicide attempt. Paris received medical attention and would no longer testify. Prince, Michael's son, did go on to take the stand. He told jurors that his father would often cry after talking to AEG Live executives and the pop icon feared for his life leading up to the concerts. It was very clear that Prince felt that Michael Jackson felt really pushed to the brink by AEG executives. He didn't trust them, he didn't like them, and he heard his own father say, while sobbing, they're trying to kill me. Only a jury could decide if that were true. 
The verdict came months after the trial began. Question one. Did AEG Live hire Dr. Conrad Murray? Answer, yes. But when the court assistant read the second question, was Dr. Conrad Murray unfit or incompetent to perform the work for which he was hired? Answer, no. Jurors decided that AEG Live was not liable for Michael Jackson's death. The verdict means the Jackson family will not get any money from AEG Live. Still, Katherine Jackson claims the trial has never been about money. She was asked during her testimony why, and she said, I want to know what happened to my son. It is a search for the truth. Coming up. My brother's the baddest boy that ever held a microphone. That boy was bad. And we'll never have another one. The king of pop remembered. He is everything to music. This man was a universal pop icon. And I'm going to miss him. I'm going to miss him so much. Bad, the song, and the video not only transformed Michael Jackson's image from soft-spoken to tough, but changed the face of pop culture. My brother was the baddest boy that ever held a microphone. That boy was bad. And we'll never have another one. My question is, why does the good die young? The good, the good, why? Why him? And sometimes there's no answers. Icon, pop star, legend. Words that didn't seem big enough to describe the man who eventually became the king of pop. When my brother died, the world cried. But he meant so much to me. He influenced like my whole world. Michael, thank you for the music you gave us all. The world will miss you. We love you. Then, nearly three weeks after the singer's death, a Hollywood memorial service that rivaled royalty, seen by millions around the world. The Andre Crouch Choir sang as Jackson's brothers carried his casket. The king of pop is not big enough for him. He is simply the greatest entertainer that ever lived. you life. It was an emotional ceremony. I love you, Michael, and I'll miss you. With a heartbreaking ending. Daddy has been the best father you could ever imagine. And I just wanted to say I love him so much. I'm not going to see him anymore, but I feel him everywhere. I really do. God picks certain people to do certain things. He knew he would be the loudest voice for the world to say, man in the mirror, heal the world. And then when it got to a point where they didn't realize and they didn't want to hear that message anymore, I thought he took him. He took him back. He gave him to us, and he took him back. You know, maybe he's appreciated in, in another way now. But I know one thing. There'll never be another Michael Jackson, not in my lifetime, or yours, or anybody else's that's on this earth right now. I just miss his laughter and his candor and just the person he was, uh, just a loving brother. My little brother, that's what I miss, my little brother.
every 25, 30 years, a phenomenon comes along. And we happen to watch them come in. We watch them light up and thrill us. We watch them go away. And now he will be the king of pop forever. A combination of high 50,000 foot showmanship, sincerity, uniqueness, originality, passion. He is everything to music. This man was a universal pop icon. No barrier stood before this man that he didn't challenge, that he didn't break down, that he didn't tear down. And that right there, that'll never be replaced. And I'm gonna miss him. I'm gonna miss him so much. Michael Jackson was the complete package of an entertainer. I mean, not only could he sing, but he was visually dynamite. If there was one song that you could, if, if someone asked you to sing in tribute to Michael Jackson at a service or whatever, what do you think you'd sing? How I feel about him, I would probably sing um, Never Can Say Goodbye. Can you sing a little bit, please? Never can say goodbye. No, 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 I never can say goodbye. Okay? Because I won't.